Reza Aslan's new book about Jesus, Zealot, has caught the attention of many people, mine included. I've taught college and seminary level courses about the historical Jesus. I've written a couple books about uh, interpreting Jesus' actions and Jesus' words in light of the historical context. So I'm attracted to the purpose of his book, putting Jesus in his times. Unfortunately, when I looked at the details after all of the media buzz, I found his work to have a number of flaws. So here's my five historical moves that Reza Aslan makes, which start off well, but end badly. The first one is putting Jesus in his times. I'm a huge fan of understanding his identity, his actions, the nuances of the words he says in different geographic locations. There's so much you can learn. I've packed tons of that into a recent book I wrote called Reenacting the Way of Jesus. However, when Reza makes those interpretations, he's missing a lot of literature. He simply hasn't read enough of the Second Temple Jewish literature, enough Jewish apocalypses, enough uh, of the apocryphal books. He hasn't gone uh, through enough of the Dead Sea Scrolls to understand how Jews were, in fact, interpreting the Messiah and, and what he would do and what would happen when he shows up. There's a lot of different interpretations going on. There's a lot going on with what rabbis were teaching at the time that we still have recorded in the Mishnah and the Talmuds. If you miss that material, then you come up with a simplified view of here a, a Jew claiming to bring the kingdom of God must be a political revolutionary, and Reza falls victim to an absence of knowledge about the diversity of Jewish movements in the first century. A second historical move that doesn't work out quite right is he begins by emphasizing the importance of the crucifixion. That's great. It is a defining moment in Jesus' uh, uh, work, ministry. It's a defining action in terms of his identity. But the fact that Reza considers this to be one of only two things we know historically about Jesus, the other being that he was a Jew who lived in uh, what the Romans called Palestine, simply because uh, that is what Romans historians tell us, and everything else in the gospel is untrustworthy. That's a poor move uh, when you look at what we've discovered. Uh, for example, um, the Gospel of Mark is now uh, understood to be uh, a, a full of excellent storytelling techniques. And the church historian Eusebius tells us that Mark got his information from listening to Peter give oral presentations about the life and ministry of Jesus. See, all of these things when you add them up together and look at Mark's uh, uh, many references in, in Aramaic, uh, you see here that whether or not this book was written later in the first century, you, you've got to give credence to much of what we find there in that gospel because it certainly does seem to reflect the oral accounts of eyewitnesses who spoke the language in the context where Jesus did his ministry. So it seems there's a few more things than two that we can know about Jesus, historically speaking. Third historical mistake that occurs is Reza begins uh, superbly by saying, man, Jesus' actions, Jesus' words, they look like a guy who was claiming to be the Messiah. Unfortunately, Reza believes that the Messiah is a solely political figure. That someone who is passionate about the temple and passionate about God's laws ultimately needed to violently attack Rome and throw them out of town. Uh, he makes this mistake again because he simply hasn't gone and read uh, the understanding of the Messiah in the temple scroll. Uh, that we found at Qumran, or in the Messianic Apocalypse from those same Dead Sea Scrolls, or Fourth Ezra, the Apocalypse of Baruch, these other interpretations of when the Messiah comes and the old era changes to a new age. Uh, he, he, he doesn't see that there are more options for understanding this Messiah to come, this servant of God described in Isaiah 52 and 53. Fourth move that he makes, which I commend at first, but then quickly question is that uh, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem is, is a claim to be king. 
it is Jesus saying, I am the king, right? Messiah means anointed one. This is the one uh, who, who, who has been recognized by God to be the next king of his, his people. And what he's doing there, coming to the city triumphantly in fulfillment of prophecy of this great king to come, is making that claim, which would anger Rome. The problem I have is, again, that Reza cannot accept that there is an understanding of the Messiah which is nonviolent, where God's kingdom can come, but it doesn't mean Jesus wants his uh, soldiers, or if he had them, to, to arm up and attack Rome and to have uh, redemption by a bloodbath. Last historical move that starts off well, but ends badly, is Reza understands that Paul's vision of Jesus is different than what the Gospels present. This is accurate. They are looking at the situation from two different perspectives. And so although he wants to argue that Paul created a new Jesus and called him the Christ, he called, you know, called him the Messiah, and it was a heavenly being, uh, that, that Paul created that out of this earthly man is just a bit disappointing when you look at the fact that Jews were anticipating God to fulfill the prophetic hopes of sending the Messiah. And that when that happened, that this Messiah would be recognized as king in the heavenly throne of God himself. And when that was done, that this old age of what had been going on on earth, that there would be a brand new age where the spiritual realities would be changed. And so he fails to see how, how this, this, this grand intervention of God that the Jews were expecting, and that Paul himself, very familiar with this old age, new age, apocalyptic view of time, when he looks and experiences, ah, Jesus, a Messiah, a heavenly Lord in heaven, he realizes everything has changed. And so the Gospels show you kind of a, a pre-change of era, uh, uh, Jesus really preaching the restoration of Israel to Israel, and then Paul, after the New Covenant era has been inaugurated, comes back, and he preaches how the restoration of Israel brought forgiveness of sins to all those who were connected to the Messiah, now applies to the world. There's my five historical moves that Reza Aslan makes that start off well and end badly. I hope that helps you get a grasp of what's worth uh, taking from the book, and that what else has problems which require us to dismiss his conclusions. Okay, I'm not done. There's four more mistakes that Reza Aslan makes that lead to a misrepresentation of who Jesus is. Number one, Reza takes historical guesses as fact, but the Gospels as fiction. For example, he looks at Jesus and says, well, he probably worked in Sepphoris since he was a stonemason or a carpenter of sorts, and that city was under construction near Nazareth in the first century. Well, that's a guess. We have no literary record that would connect Jesus or someone in his family to that city and what was going on there. However, when it comes to the Gospels, for example, asserting that Jesus was nonviolent, in the way in which he was bringing about the kingdom of God. For example, when he says, uh, it's okay to pay taxes to Rome, Aslan comes back and says, well, that's misinterpreted or misrepresented or simply changed by the Christians later on to appeal to the Roman conscience. It's arbitrary. Number two, second mistake he makes is an inconsistent use of historical background information. When it serves his purpose, he'll say, ah, only lestai, only insurrectionists and political rebels were crucified, and therefore Jesus was exactly that. However, when it comes to, say, Luke twenty-two thirty-six, where Jesus says, uh, get your money bag, sell your cloak, buy a, buy a sword in order to prepare yourselves for what's to come, at that point, he says, ah, look at this. Jesus, he's a revolutionary. He wants to kill people. He's bloodthirsty. They're getting swords. Well, in the context, Jesus says, uh, 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 do that. The disciples say, we have two swords. He says, that's enough. Well, that would not be enough to take on the Roman army. Clearly, Jesus is making a symbolic statement. 
he is orchestrating his own arrest, leading to these cataclysmic activities which would define who he is as the sacrificial lamb. The third mistake that Aslan makes is an arbitrary trust in non-biblical historical sources. For example, Josephus, the Jewish historian, writing at the end of the first century, he trusts him more than Matthew and Luke, who he's saying wrote down their Gospels at the end of the first century. Well, Josephus has been discredited on a number of counts, specifically things related to the Jewish rebellion against Rome around 70 AD. But he continues to say, if Josephus says there's all these messiahs and this is the way life is in Israel in the first century, I can trust him, but I can't trust Matthew or Luke when Luke says he's using earlier sources, and in fact the church historian Eusebius says Matthew originally referred to earlier Hebrew sayings of Jesus. And so why would we dismiss writers' uh, biographical accounts simply because they're written a generation or two after that person lived? Certainly today we wouldn't say that the latest biography of Abraham Lincoln or Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, is, is, is wrong, false, contrived, or off, simply because it's written so long after that person lived, if in fact the person writing it used sources close to that time period and accurately represented who it is they're writing about. Well, the fourth and final error that I think is made that misrepresents Jesus from an historical perspective is that Aslan simply displays an ignorance of the wealth of primary sources that exist from the time that show not a uh, simple and, and kind of narrow view of Jewish society, but a very complex and diverse uh, group or a set of movements among the Jews. For example, in Aslan's book, he claims that because Jesus is bringing in the kingdom of God, since he is uh, claiming to be Messiah and doing that, well, of course, he's a political revolutionary. At one point he says it would be ridiculous to think otherwise. Well, how ridiculous would that be when we have other writings? For example, the rabbis captured in the Babylonian Talmud that says if we could just get people to obey the Sabbath laws for two times, then God would redeem his people. The, the, the kingdom would show up. He would break in and set us free from the oppression we suffer under. Well, that's a very non-violent view of how the kingdom of God could come. And the folks at Qumran, the Essene group, uh, what we have recorded in the Dead Sea Scrolls give us numerous views of how the kingdom could come through a, a kind of a holy isolation of folks who are righteous and true in all of their ways. And that, in fact, would then bring on the beginning of the end to this era of oppression and the launch of the new and next age where the Messiah reigns. So time and again, Reza Aslan demonstrates a, a, a quick, biased, and arbitrary use of historical sources all along, saying this is an historical account of who Jesus is. That's handle, that's just hard for us to handle, those of us who have spent a lot of time reading the literature that exists from this time period and understand what was going on among the Jews and the transition to the Christian era. No, I'm still not done. One more. The statement in his book that Christians after the time of Jesus redefined the definition of the Messiah in order to make Jesus more palatable to a Roman audience when they're on their conversion journey led by the Apostle Paul, that statement, that idea, just continues to reflect an absence of knowledge about the diversity of interpretations going on. There were lively debates. You can read about it, uh, say, in the Book of Enoch, about who the Messiah will be, what he'll do, when he'll come, what that looks like in the physical realm, in the spiritual realm. And so for Paul to come along and provide another interpretation rooted in his, in his understanding of prophecies housed in Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Isaiah, it's nothing new. It's nothing out of the ordinary, and it's nothing that Christians were forcing in order to get Jesus accepted by the powerful pagans on their way to getting the Romans to approve Christianity as their, as, 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 as their national religion. Long before Jesus shows up or the Christian message goes out, we have 
many Romans who are attracted to the Jewish faith, many who had converted in different ways and at different levels of becoming God-fearers of the God of the Jews. There was already a certain palatability or appeal that did not need to be created, and the Christians certainly weren't doing anything different than what other Jews were doing as they sought to figure out who the Messiah would be and what his significance to them was. So to recap, Reza misses the boat in a number of ways. He has an arbitrary trust in non-biblical historical sources thinking the Gospels are just fiction. He thinks uh, Christians have to redefine and recreate who Jesus actually was to make him appeal when they were simply doing what other folks looking for the Messiah were doing in that time period. He also believes that there was just kind of one picture of how the kingdom of God would come on earth and therefore Jesus was a political revolutionary. That doesn't square with the divergent Jewish movements in the first century. The last two, he uses historical guesses as facts, and it makes his bias come through when he's picking stuff he likes and questioning stuff he doesn't like without good grounds for doing so, or without even paying attention to a proper interpretation of, say, verses in the Gospels he wants to throw out that don't line up with his picture of Jesus. Ultimately, all of this leads to what he is most guilty of, and that is an inconsistent use of historical background information. It's picking and choosing, picking and choosing. And even though somewhere in his end notes there might be a reference to someone who does know these things, he doesn't integrate what we understand about the diversity of opinions, the theological hopes and expectations, the, the religious, political, social, and cultural tensions that were going on, into which Jesus shows up in the portraits of the Gospels, although each one speaks to a different audience, refers to a man who in every way claimed to be the Messiah, acted and spoke like one, introducing a new covenant age, an era with changed rules and changed spiritual realities. And this man certainly does not seem to be misunderstood, abused, and recreated by Christians to make him fit, but in fact one who does realize the hopes of the Jews and look a whole lot like a messianic figure in first century A.D.